As promised, uh, welcome to uh, the session, the afternoon session, where we continue basically the problems we started in the morning. And uh, as uh, we discussed already, problems 22 and 23, and I cannot emphasize how important they are, because although they may be simple, they may look kind of uh, very simple, but they are extremely important because they reiterate the concept. So basically, the key thing, the first one is the intensity of the wave I, which is really the power as it spreads over an area. And that intensity is actually the average of the pointing vector. And from there, we got a lot of information, a lot of, uh, a lot of the stuff. We can find basically the force, we can find the pressure, we can find the energy density, we can find all kinds of things. We can find the electric field, the magnetic field, name it. Okay, so there is a lot of information hidden in there, and uh, I hope that you, you guys will review, and I know a lot of you are not in right now live, that you go back and review what we learned in lecture and review these two specific problems, because they give you a lot of insight on how to handle problems from chapter 32. I mean, they seem daunting, the concepts themselves too, especially, but at the end, uh, it boils down to a few relationships and you have to decipher one from the other, from the other, from the other. You have a bunch of symbols that are first of all overlapping in names, let alone the, uh, the, the, you have the P and the P and the P, the P for the pressure, the, and that is a key concept and the pressure that two types of materials usually, there are the perfectly reflecting materials and those they have a two in it for both the force and the, uh, and the pressure. And the uh, absorbing materials, they don't have a two in them, but they either have only one in them. And there are materials actually, normal materials are just basically partially reflective, partially uh, uh, absorbing. So their factor in it depends on how much they reflect or how much they absorb, whichever it's the, uh, the opposite of the other one. And this is important because uh, whenever we study uh, objects, basically we look at their property, physical properties, and this is one of them that is of interest to us, how much they absorb and reflect uh, uh, radiation. Uh, there were some other ideas that I wanted to, yes, the other point also that emerged from the lecture is the fact, look, we're gonna be dealing mainly with polarized light. Okay, and we're gonna take the simple case that we did in lecture, namely polarized in only specific direction. There is a problem actually in the book that I was hesitant to, I mean, that I was tempting to do, and that's problem 50. And problem 50, you have the electric field has two components actually. Let's say for example, the X and Y components, the magnetic field will have just enough also its X and Y components in such a way that their sum of the electric field and the sum of the magnetic field will always be perpendicular to one another. So because one has two components, the other one will have two components in such a way the resultants will be perpendicular, which is a key concept in here for the planar waves in a sense that they are always, the electric field and the magnetic field, they are perpendicular to the one another and they have the same mathematical form. In other words, if one of them is a sign of something, the other one is also a sign of the same thing. If one of them is a cosine of something, 95 degrees plus 23 plus whatever number it is that you want to throw in the argument of the cosine or the sine, it's going to be the same argument for the other. They are always in phase basically with one another. Okay, and that is a consequence actually of the uh, Faraday Max Maxwell's law after Mr. Maxwell fixed Faraday, uh, I mean, Ampere Maxwell law, where after Mr. Ampere uh, Maxwell fixed Ampere's law, and then you have Faraday lens law. So those two relationships are the one that are ensure, ensuring the orthogonality of the electric field and the magnetic field. And the other two actually, namely the divergences in this case, because both of them are zero. The one for the magnetic field turned out to be zero all the time. For the electric field, it's only true zero here in this case, because we really don't have charges. We are far away from them. So in that case also, that is, which makes it a little bit harder to try to analyze, for example, wave inside materials. So when electromagnetic wave hits a material, at that point, I have charges floating around, I have currents floating around. So these solutions become, need to be modified inside materials, okay? So the mechanism of absorption, the mechanism of reflection requires more work, if you wish. How uh, the electrodynamics in this case act, uh, acts on materials. So we're not there. We are far away from the material, so we don't have to worry about it. So this is the truth. 
And then there was an outstanding relationship that we found in there, and that relationship is the fact that uh, two of them actually, that omega two is equal to Kc, just like any other wave. Omega, the angular frequency, namely two pi times the frequency, is equal to uh, K, which is the wave number, two pi over lambda times the speed, in this case, turned out to be the speed of light. When we worked out the algebra, it turns out to be exactly the speed of light, which is that light is a special case of the electromagnetic waves. So this is in a nutshell, the concepts that are being dealt with in this chapter. So I'm hoping that you guys chew on them, especially through these two examples, 22 and 23. And uh, they reiterate a lot of these ideas that we have. It's Mr. Pointing actually after he recognized that quantity in there later on was named after him, that played almost, described everything else which turned out is average really is the intensity of the, of the wave, okay? So everything else is just carried out basically by that S. It gives me the direction with which the wave moves and also the intensity, the instantaneous intensity of that wave. So that is basically in a nutshell what I want you guys to take from, uh, I mean, from this up to this point. I promise we will also do problems 46, which was supposed to be next, and then problem 44, which was supposed to be after that. And then we're going to do problem 42. Note that problem 44 and problem 37 are no different than, one, than the other. One of them calculates the force, and the other one calculates the torque. So basically for problem 42 or 37, you have two materials. One of them is perfectly reflecting and another one perfectly absorbing. And they're sitting on the, on the arm length of, of a rod. Now, one of them will be uh, subject to twice the force because it's reflecting. The other one will be just subject to that force. So there is an imbalance on the forces in here. So the torque, which is going to be the difference of the two torques, will cause this thing to spin. You're supposed to find the alpha for that. After you find the force using the formulas, because you have the intensity, so you can find the force. One of them is twice the other. You multiply that force by the distance, which is 50 centimeters in this case, 50 centimeters squared, that is. You have to. We use the proper unit, 0.5 squared. And now you have the, the, the torque of one and you have the torque of the other. Take the difference of that, both of them because of the two plates are subject to the same radiation. This one is pushing in this, being pushed in this direction and the other one is pushed in the same direction. But one of them is twice the other. So there is a net effect in here of spinning that is going to occur. So I'm hoping if we do problem 44, problem 37 becomes easy, okay? So, Let's get going. So let me first of all find where my notes are supposed to be. Here they are. And let me share with you the screen. And let me bring this one up close in here and grab my pen. So the next problem that we, I promised to do, and I know I mentioned that to being a part of an exam at some point not too long ago. Obviously the data and the circumstances are a little different and so the types of lasers, lasers are different. But the idea is the same. So here is a problem. Uh, this is problem 46. And I need you to grab a piece of paper and a pen, a bunch of papers, not just one, and start working with me on these problems. So the, uh, for the problem says, the company where you work has obtained and stored five lasers. Lasers A, B, C, D, and E. So there are five lasers. So we have A, here it is. B, C, D, and E, total of five lasers. Laser one, okay, let's do this. You have been tasked to determine the intensity of the electromagnetic radiation produced by each laser. The lasers are marked with specifications, but unfortunately different information is given for each laser. Each one was bought from a different company and each company that basically uh, sells it has a different way of uh, labeling them. So basically now your task is to rank them in terms of intensity, which one is the more intense, which one the least intense, okay? They may have all be the same frequency. They may be all the same color, but one of them probably is more intense than the other. So the first one, they give you the power P equals to 2.6 watts, but I need to know how the, the width, 
what's the spot? Is it too fine or is it too uh, broad? If it is too broad, then it's not that, that intense radiation. It needs to be focused. So for that, we need the diameter. So this is D. So they gave us D now. And D, they said, it's 2.6 millimeter. If that's the case, then I know the intensity of this guy. It's just P over A. And the A is pi times D over 2 squared. So we have the power. We have the diameter. We should be able to find the intensity. Make sense? Yes? Yes, it, it makes sense. Very good. So this is easy. As a matter of fact, this is so easy that even I can do it. Okay. So B, for B, they didn't give us anything but the electric field, E naught. They said the amplitude of the electric field, E naught, is 480 volt per meter. So let's look for a relationship that involved, and we've used it several times. It's that square root of two mu naught. See, it's this in the expression. Except now they gave me the intensity, they gave me the uh, electric field, I need to find the, uh, the intensity. So the intensity is gonna be E naught squared divided by two mu naught C. So in this case, as a technician, I'm going to take this electric field, square it and divide it by two mu naught C. C is the speed of light, it's constant, 300,000 kilometers per second. I have to use it in meters or at 300 million meters per second. Uh, mu naught is four pi times 10 to the negative seven. And E naught is given 480 volts or so, uh, volt per meter. So I have to do is square this thing and I'm in business. So this is easy too, okay? Uh, the amplitude of the magnetic field. So here they gave us the magnetic field instead which is 8.7 micro Tesla. I mean, they gave you in the book 10 to the negative six Tesla, which is the same thing. Okay, now I can't use that expression. I mean, I could because I know that E naught is actually BC, B naught C. So all I have to do is square this quantity, which gives me C squared in here, which cancel one of the C's. So I could write the intensity in here as just C times B naught squared over two mu naught. So this one also can be found. I can do that too. Uh, part D, I mean, uh, part D. Laser D, they give me the diameter D. And the diameter D, they said it's 1.8 millimeter. I didn't mean to do that. No. Okay, that's one thing, that's not enough. And they gave me also the force on a totally reflecting surface. So on a totally reflecting surface, they gave me this force and they said the force is six times 10 to the negative eight Newton. Please note the sig figs. There are two sig figs everywhere, all of this data. Okay, I was about to write 6.0 because that's basically what they are writing. So it's 6.0, that means I have two sig figs in here. So those all of my answers now. I have a force and a diameter. I better be, fine. I'll be able to find what this intensity is. Let's see if there is an expression that we worked out. Otherwise, we can derive it. It's no big deal. Okay, we have enough equations to manipulate this thing. I think I saw somewhere a force in here. If not, we can go back into the lecture and find it. So, no, not this problem. So let's go into the lecture and dig around and find a force and how it's related to the intensity. It's going to be probably related to a pointing vector. Remember, the average of the pointing vector is going to be uh, uh, the intensity. So where is the force? And here is the force. It's actually the power over uh, C. And I can divide this power by the area and multiply by it. So let's, let's write it down. Let's derive this thing, OK? So it's P over C. Let's do that. So the force is P, the power over C. That means the power is equal to CF, where C is the speed of light, which means the intensity, which is basically the, uh, the power over the area, is simply going to be CF over the area. 
Okay, I have everything in here. I have the force, which is six times 10 to the negative eight. I have the diameter, which gives me the area, and I have the speed of light. So this intensity now becomes C times the force that is given divided by pi times D over two squared. So even this one, I can find the intensity for it, for D. I have, uh, this is laser D. I mean, uh, this is not the, I should have used a different symbol for the diameter. So this is the diameter, do not confuse the two Ds. And this is laser D, okay? Now laser E, for laser E, they gave me the average energy density in the beam. So they gave me U, U bar being equal to three times 10 to the negative seven joules per cubic meter. Okay, there is another relationship that involves the, the energy U bar, where is it? It's probably still up there. I'm going looking at the notes from the lecture. Here it is, U bar is equal to S bar over C and S bar is I, exactly. So U bar is equal to I over C, U bar is equal to I over C from here, I, the intensity is C times U bar. So now imagine with me that I found IE for laser E, I found ID for laser D, I found IC for laser C, I found IB for laser B, and finally I have found IA for laser A. It's not hard for me to compare to see which one has a more intensity, more intense and the least intense. Does this make sense? This problem? Yes. Yes. Just plugging the numbers. Make sure you're working in uh, uh, SI though. So, so the question, let me go. Calculate the incentive for the each and rank the lasers in order of increasing intensity. That means you start with the smallest all the way to the most intense. Okay. This is number one, this is number two, so, so on and so forth, okay? So that is really how the, uh, assume that the laser beams have uniform intensity distributed over their cross sections. So in other words, I mean, unlike the laser beam that you guys see in here, doesn't look like it's doing it, spread. Okay, assume that it's not spreading, it's all in the same focused area, as long as, okay? So, this takes care of this problem then. I'm gonna leave it to you guys to do the actual numbers. So let's do problem 44 now. Hopefully you guys are ready to do all of these things. So problem 44, NASA, so this is problem 44, is giving uh, serious consideration to the concept of solar sailing. The solar uh, sail craft use a large low mass sail and the energy and momentum of sunlight for proportion. Should the sail be absorbing or reflecting? That is obvious, it has to be reflecting because if it's reflecting, the force is twice. Because if it absorbs, then the force is half. So if you're an engineer at NASA, this is an obvious question. So the answer to that, it has to be reflecting because there the pressure is double, okay? When it hits the ray and bounce back, then in this case, I get two, the impulse would be twice as much. So that's an obvious question. That's actually from the lecture. And uh, why? Again, because of the fact that the, uh, the, the impulse will be doubled in this case, in the case of reflection, okay? The total power output of the sun is, this is how much the sun have power on average, 3.9 times 10 to the power 26 watts. It's a huge number, okay? Because it's a big star, so it's a small object. How large a sail is necessary to prop propel a 10,000 kilogram spacecraft against the gravitational force of the sun? Express your result in square kilometers. Here is the deal. You have a 10, kilogram sail craft, 10,000 kilogram sail craft. It's a big one. This is its mass, okay? And you need sails now large enough 
to propel it forward. So this is the force due to radiation. Okay. However, this thing is being dragged back toward the Earth by the force uh, toward the Sun by the force of gravity. And the force of gravity, if you guys remember from physics for A, is just basically G times the mass of the uh, sail, sail craft times the mass of the sun, big M of the sun, divided by the distance squared. Let's say, for example, the distance is R, divided by R squared. So this is the force. Here, it's going, we just wrote it down, actually, the force is equal to Uh, the, what is it? The, the power over C. Did I write it down, the power over C? But the power at that point, you have to be very careful now. So this is the power delivered to this cross section A. So that means I have to take the radiation of the Earth's sun because here is the sun. The sun sends every second 3.9 times 10 to the power 26 joules. Those joules, they, they move around in space on a big sphere. By the time they reach in here, they're spread over a sphere whose size is four pi r squared. That is the size of the sphere. Out of, so I'm not collecting all of the 3.9 times 10 to the power 26 watts. I'm only collecting the amount that hits the here, okay? So the first thing I need to find is the intensity of the radiation at this point. The intensity of the radiation of the sun is four pi, I mean, is the power divided by the area through which it spread completely. And it spread throughout the, the sphere because the radiation go all every which way. So if we happen to be on this side of the sun, we see the sun because of the radiation. If we happen to be on the other side of the sun, we see it. If we happen to be on top, we see it. If you happen below this, whichever way, as long as you are in a sphere of radius R, you're gonna see the radiation. You're gonna see this intensity, which is the power of the sun divided by uh, four pi R squared. Now out of that, I'm going to collect this much on this area. So out of that, the power on the sail This is the only thing that is going to be collected in our cell is I times the area of the cell. Okay, the area, I don't know. That's actually what we're supposed to find. So this is the power divided by C, remember? I have to divide it by C to get the expression that I need. What is the force? Force is equal to the power collected divided by C. So now, I have to multiply, I have to multiply this intensity by A, which makes it big P times A divided by four pi R squared times, uh, and then divided by C. So these two forces at least need to balance each other for this to escape. If there is not enough radiation force in here, it's not, it's going to fall back toward the sun because of the gravity actually. But, if it has more radiation, more intense radiation, then it should be able to make it. For that, I need to make A big. If I make A huge, then in this case, I would have collected enough intensity in here to push it in the thing. And that is the engineering problem that we have to face in here. So our problem as the engineers is now to find the proper A. So let's equate at least this two to find the minimum A. After that, it's going to work. Double the A at that point, it should have stronger force. Now it's going to have the a huge acceleration. So let's do that. So the minimum force that we need to do is need to be G times the mass of the sail, which is 10,000 kilograms, times the mass of the sun, which I need to Google to find it, time divided by R squared. These two forces at least needs to be equal for the minimum area. So this is the minimum area that we will need, divided by uh, 4 pi R squared and the speed of light. Note immediately that doesn't matter how far we are, it cancels, that the R cancels. They didn't give us that. Actually, if you read the problem, they tell you, part C, if you notice, explain why your answer to part B is independent of the distance from the sun. Well, first of all, the force of gravity is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. And then this one is inversely proportional to the uh, to the area of where, where the uh, the radiation is uh, uh, spread, and that area is proportional to the square of the distance. So in this case, both R squares cancel, and that's why this it doesn't matter how far you are. So we need to find the a min in here from this expression, a min 
the minimum area is going to be G times the mass of the uh, sail, sailcraft times the mass of the sun times the speed of light divided by the power that the sun generates. So let's plug in the numbers, A min then. G is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. This is from physics for A, okay? Times the mass, they tell me it's 10 to the power four, 10,000 kilograms. Times the mass of the sun, if you Google it, it's two times 10 to the, negative, to the positive 30 kilograms. Times the speed of light, which is uh, three times 10 to the power eight. The whole thing divided by 3.9, I'm gonna write it as four times 10 to the power 26. So we have 10 to the power 26 and 10 to the power 30. I'm done with 10 to the power four. 10 to the power four plus uh, four, that's eight, plus eight, that's 16. 16 minus 11, that is actually uh, 10 to the power five. So everything is done in here for except this one. Okay, I need to do the numbers now. I have two times three, which is six times 6.67 divided by four. So the numbers at the end are six times 6.67. Let's make this one 3.9 back again to hopefully get a better answer because that's the only approximation we really need to use. We could simplify the two and the four and make this one easy, but that's fine. We can leave it 6.67 times six divided by four. And the whole thing again, 3.9, and the whole thing again is times 10 to the to the to the to the positive five square meters, and they want us to use actually uh, uh, kilometers. I know one kilometer is a thousand meters, so uh, if I divide by thousand squared, the answer is going to be instead of meters is going to be in kilometers squared. Okay, so this is 10 to the power six and 10 to the power five. I would be left with just a 10 in the denominator. In other words, the A min is going to be six times 6.67 divided by 39 and kilometer squared. I know I'm manipulating a lot of powers and this is really what I want you to take from this class too, how to play around with the powers because it's much easier for me to punch in the calculator six times 6.67 divided by 39 and even the 39 and the six, I can simplify them to some extent. This is 13 and this is two, okay? So I could do that uh, mental math if you wish to make the punching as easy as possible for me not to make a lot of mistakes. Because if I do this on a calculator or if I have a lot of powers left and right, I am prone to forget one number here and there. And if I do that, I'm gonna get a mistake, especially with a power. I mean, I'd rather make a mistake here with the numbers than having to have a, a wrong power in there because it's gonna throw the whole thing off completely. So what I end up with at the end, two times 6.67 divided by 13. Okay, and the answer is 1.026 square meters. Did I use the right formula for all of this or not? There is a problem with this formula. For part D in here, it's wrong. Hopefully you guys caught this one. There is a two here. Because they tell you the problem is reflecting, which makes that whatever you see a P in here, there is a two next to it. So hopefully you guys have fixed that, okay? And the P in this case, so there is a two everywhere in here in this problem. Because this is reflecting, you have to pay attention. The formula I used was for an absorbing. Same thing in here. I think there is a two on this number here because it's reflecting. We want it to be reflecting, remember? So that the A becomes a little smaller than, uh, than the, uh, if A, if this is not uh, reflecting, the number is gonna be big. Actually, it should be less than what I just found. I found 1.026, so it's gonna be slightly less, which is better. I mean, as an engineer, you take whatever error you can get, okay? So again, everywhere you see a P now in this formula, I have to multiply it by two because it's perfectly reflecting. So there is a two in here. So the answer will have a two in the denominator also. And that two is the last two that cancels that two. So at the end, it should be just 6.67 divided by, can I write, no, I have to, man, this thing is not responding. 
6.67 divided, which it should be half, which is good. 500, uh, I mean, 0.5 kilometer is a lot easier, kilometer squared is a lot easier to build than a square kilometer, which is a huge sale, okay? So in other words, I have 6.67 divided by 13, and that is 0.513 kilometer. Remember, I think there are two in this one. There are two sick pigs. So it's 0. 0.551 kilometers squared, which is kind of easy, okay? If you uh, square root this number to find the actual physical size, because it's an area, let's say for example, it's actually square, okay? If it's a square, each side needs to be three quarters of a, of a kilometer, which is big. Instead of a full kilometer, because the other one would have been a full kilometer. So three quarters of a kilometer, 700 meters. It's seven stadiums, basically. Seven football fields on each side. It's a lot of sales. I mean, take, take the football field on the length, not on the width, the length. And take seven of them and put them one in front of the other, facing one another, basically, head on. And then take another seven from the other side, basically 49 football fields. This is exactly what this number is, because seven times seven is 49. Actually, it's rounded up, down a little because of the fact that the, the, the 100, 100 meters is slightly more than a football field. The football field is less than actually. I mean, this is a soccer field, but 49 soccer fields or maybe about 50 football fields. Isn't this a big sale? To your sale? To your sale, actually. Because you have to take these fields and basically tie them together in a very small reflecting material. Super massive. Does this problem make sense to you guys? Yeah, it, it makes sense. OK, yes. very good. Okay, look at the problem uh, 42 with me for uh, 37 for a second. You will see on one side I have F, and that F is equal to 2P, uh, in this case, divided times the area of, the, uh, of those squares, divided by the, uh, no, they gave me the intensity in here completely. So let me, let me mention problem 37 without having to do it. So problem 37, they gave you I, and you're supposed to find F. F is going to be exactly equal to two for one of them, the reflecting material. Two I times the area divided by the speed of light. So this is one of materials, okay? It's exactly the same formula that we have in here, except they gave me I in there, okay? So two I there times A divided by C. And the second one will be the same one. So this is the reflecting. The second one, which is the absorbing material, will be I A over C. And this materials, one of them is here, the other one is here. This is the absorbing, and the other one is the reflecting. We hit them with the radiation at the same time. Both of them connected in here through a rod that is uh, one meter long. So that means this point in here is 50 centimeters or 0.5 meters. This one is 0.5 meters. Obviously, I have twice force going this way versus a smaller force going in here. So this will result in a spin. Okay, so now you have the torque. The torque is going to be basically the force reflecting times 0 0.5 squared, 0 0.5 only, then no 0 0.5 squared. The torque has only the minus because the other one is opposite to it. This is actually the motion. Is, if, if this is the case, it's going to be clock, uh, clockwise. That's fine. So the, the torque, which is I alpha, is equal to, in this case, uh, the force of the absorbing material times 0.5, okay? But this one is half this one. So there is a net torque in here, in other words. So this is the net torque, and that will result in an angular acceleration. I for this one, if you treat them as point particles, I is going to be just m r squared, but you have two of them. R, in this case, is 0.5 squared. That is where the 0.5 squared is is but you have two of them because when they spin they spin both of them so you treat them as point particles so you have the i and you have the tau net, tau, uh, tau net 
And from here, you're gonna find alpha. Does problem 37 make sense without even having to do it? Just by doing this, this note in here for this courses? Yeah, it doesn't seem like a hard yeah. problem. Very good. Like so let's get into the, the hard problem. The one that I think you guys need to have all everything coming together. Problem 42. Okay. And this is going to be the last problem that we're going to do uh, together. So this problem is kind of hard a little bit. So here is a problem. So, so basically what they gave you, I'm going to draw it hopefully, let me go back to the drawing tool and let me draw a bunch of rectangles, control C, control V. Password tool, control C, control V. Just to mimic the, uh, the, the fact that we have uh, basically uh, uh, so many loops in here. And the last one I'm going to do. So you have a bunch of wires basically wrapped around in a certain geometry where uh, this size in here is A. And this too is A. OK. And look at the axes in here. The axes are specifically given to be, let me uh, take a different color just to draw the axis. This is one of them. And uh, this is another axis, perpendicular to it, of course. And finally, the last one is here. So what do we have in here in this problem? This, they called it the y-axis. This is the x, the z-axis, and this is the x-axis, okay? Now, what else do we know? We have, of course, our, this is just one, uh, one, one turn. This is one uh, wire connected, I mean, wrapped around this way. So at some point, it starts from one end and comes to the other end. And in here, we have a regular resistor, R. And this is an inductance, actually, because I have a loop in here. So I have the L for it. And in here, I have a capacitor, normal everyday capacitor. And in here, we have an M meter. Usually, it's actually a galvanometer because it's supposed to detect very small currents. So I have really an RLC circuit now. OK? So basically, we have an RLC circuit, and they said there is a wave that comes in and hits this, this, uh, this, this antenna structure. And the wave is moving in the Z direction. So it comes from the bottom up. So it comes from here. OK? And then it hits the surface and emerges from the other side. But of course, it's a wave. It's not just one of them. It's not just one wave front. So many wave fronts, one after the other, after the other, after the other, OK? And when it hits this one in here, the characteristic for this wave is that it has an electric field E equals to E naught times the cosine. I, I, they write it E max, I'm writing it E naught, okay? Kz minus omega t. So this is the wave in the, in the, in the which direction? In the uh, j hat direction. So the electric field is pointing here. So this is where the electric field is. This is where the direction of propagation is. In other words, this is actually where the S vector is pointing. It's pointing in the Z direction. Since that is the case, the electric, the magnetic field has to be perpendicular to both S, because S, if you guys remember from lecture, is equal to E cross B divided by mu naught. So S and B are perpendicular. So B cannot be in the same direction as, uh, as uh, the Z axis, so period, end of the story. And in the same time, E and B are always perpendicular because of uh, Faraday's law, for example, pick up one of the two. Faraday's law says that the curl of uh, uh, E must be negative B over T. 
So it has to be perpendicular to E, no matter what. So the only place that is left for it then is along the X axis, because it cannot be in the Z direction. It cannot be in the Y direction. It has to then be in the X axis. So B is here and it's expression actually B is equal to B naught cosine because it has to have the same dependency on time. So if this one was cosine KZ or minus omega T, this also would be KZ minus omega T with the same function cosine. And now it has to be in the I hat direction. End of the story. You see now what I tell you is that when you write the problem, this was never stated to us. They gave us E only, but we deduced based on what we know, the, the vector B. Not only its form, but we know also how B is. B naught is actually equal to E naught over C. So we have everything we need to know about B. All they gave us is E. All they gave us is E, that's all. As a matter of fact, if you're asking me about uh, the vector S, I know it too. It's gonna be in the, uh, the Z hat direction. All I have to do is just do this product. So if you're curious trying to find where S is, S as a vector is simply equal to one over mu naught uh, the cross product of these two vectors. This one, the electric field is zero. The electric field is E naught cosine KZ minus omega T and zero. And the magnetic field is B naught, which is E naught over C times cosine of KZ minus omega T in the X, in the X direction, zero and zero. All I have to do is form this cross product. In the I hat direction, I will have zero times this number minus zero. So it's gonna be zero. In the uh, J hat direction, it's gonna be zero times zero, which is zero squared minus zero times this number, which is zero also. In the K hat direction, I have zero. Do I have a minus somewhere in here that is popping up in here? Why do I have a minus in this expression? E cross B. E cross B. Oh. Oh, there is a minus in here. But that's fine. Okay. That means it's pointing. We're, we care only about its magnitude. Okay. It's, it's pointing in the opposite direction. If this is, or, or keep it this way, the wave is going down and that's it. So that's fine. The wave is coming down from the top, not the, from the bottom. Okay. So that's all. So that's what this result is saying, actually. It's equal to minus E naught squared, because when you multiply E naught and E naught, that's E naught squared, over this mu naught C times the cosine squared of KZ minus omega C at any moment. So it's coming down, actually. It's not, because uh, S shows you where the wave is going, period, end of the story. So it's raining on this system. But this is not questions they didn't ask us. We didn't even get to the question. We're just trying to see what we know based on what, uh, what was given in here in this problem. Okay. So, the origin is as shown. The origin is right in the middle. So, this is the origin of the axis. Okay. I probably should delete all of these blue colors because it's getting in the way, I think. Let me see if I can delete them without causing a lot of things in here because we need some, some stuff in here. So let me delete all of these blue ones and delete also this one in here because we need to do some integrations and some integrations will require that area to be clean. But hopefully you guys see the picture in here. So the electric field is along the J hat direction. The magnetic field must be along the X direction. And the wave is actually not coming from the bottom. It's coming from the top according to our calculations in here. Okay, training from the top coming down. Okay, so uh, what is the magnitude magnetic flux through the coil in the in the uh, in the in the uh, positive uh, a direction? So here is the thing: they want the magnetic flux. So we know B. Here is B, and all we have to do is multiply it by the area to find it. Except that B depends on Z. In some points in here is different than in here because Z, it changes throughout this area. 
So I really need to sum that expression. So here is the flux of the magnetic field. So the flux, so this is part A, they want the flux of the magnetic field and the flux of the magnetic field in general is defined as the sum over BDA. Okay. Now here is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, because the Y dependence doesn't matter. What matters really, because the magnetic field is coming out of the picture, okay, coming out of the screen. So I'm going to take a strip of area of width a and height dz, okay? In very z from negative a over two to positive a over two, in doing so, I have all of the flux of the magnetic field throughout the entire area. Because this summation needs to go through the entire area. And the entire area is this area on the screen, which is of the uh, size a squared actually. But since B depends on Z, I have to be careful in here because it has Z in it. So it has to sum through Z, okay? So B is, both of them, the area is pointing in the X direction. Here is the, uh, the area. And the magnetic field is also along the Z direction. So the dot product simply becomes a product of the two quantities. So this integral becomes the integral of B which is in the uh, in the x direction only times uh, a because how what's the area of this strip it's width times height and width is a and height is dz so it's a dz okay so now i have to sub the values of b and i have b in terms of b naught which is e naught over c so this expression becomes then and the integration for z is from negative a over two to positive a over two. So this becomes, I have e naught over c, that is b naught times a times the integral from negative a over two to positive a over two of cosine of kz minus omega t over uh, dz. So I have to integrate this expression and, and the integral of something in here, which I'm gonna call u, okay, let's call u, the variable kz minus omega t. t is constant with respect to z. So it's an independent variable, so it doesn't care about z. So if z is varying from negative a over t to a, a, two to a over two, it, it doesn't matter in here, it's a constant. So what matters in this case, du, will become just kdz. So if I do this change of variable, then the integration starts uh, changes on us. So in this case, the boundaries of integration are not from negative a over two to positive a over two, they were for z. Now they become from uh, the lower limit. So I'm gonna write the low is going to be k with a negative sign a over two minus omega t. And the upper limit up is going to be k a over two minus omega t. So those are basically the new boundaries of the uh, integrations or u1 if you like it and u2, okay? So having said that, now the uh, the actual flux of the magnetic field will be equal to E naught A over C, dz, dz is equal to du over k. So I'll pull the k out, which is a constant. And then I'm left with the integral of a cosine of u du. And the integral of a cosine u du is just a sine of u, okay? So this becomes a sine of u evaluated between u1 in the lower limit and u2 in the upper limit, okay? So if I do that, then this becomes E naught A over CK times the sine of u2. u2 is K A over two minus omega T. So let me open a parenthesis in here. K A over two minus omega T and the other one is gonna be a sine of negative Ka over two minus omega two over two minus omega t. That is actually the same thing because the sine function is actually an odd function. So the sine of negative alpha is equal to, uh, uh, to sine of alpha. Negative sine of alpha. So all I have to do is put the negative, but there is another negative from the, uh, from the uh, this expression in here for the integration. So negative times negative becomes a positive. And this is a plus sine of basically at the end, Ka over two plus omega t. 
Okay, so that is the flux of the magnetic field. But they said something in the problem. They said, uh, hint, the identity of sine of two angles, sine of A plus B, sine of two angles, alpha plus beta, is equal to, according to this formula, plus, I'm sorry, sine of alpha minus beta is equal to actually uh, two times sine of alpha, sine of beta. Now, alpha is Ka over two, and beta is just omega t. So all I have to do is just to replace those things, and I am done. I have found the magnetic flux. There is a two, first of all, that comes in, in here. So I need to multiply everybody by two in here. So I have two E naught A over CK times uh, sine of alpha, and alpha is Ka over two, sine of, is it a sine or a cosine? Did I, yeah, it's a cosine. Sorry, sorry about that. That's not a sine, that's a cosine of beta. Sine of Ka over two, cosine of omega t. So this is the expression of the flux of the magnetic field. It's a lot of work. But it's not really hard when you think about it. It's just doing this integral at the end of the day. And this integral is the integral of a cosine, except it has this weird stuff in the argument. So that's why the change of variable in here is useful. Kz minus omega t is just a single variable. Since omega t is really independent, just a constant, all it does is shifts the argument in here for the integration, that's all. But the k matters in here, it rescales uh, the variable of integration. So in other words, dz is not the same as du, there is a k factor between them. And now at the end, you just have this integration and it's a matter of plugging the numbers. They gave you this identity, so it's not uh, that you have to go and look for it somewhere or something like that, okay? So, we found the flux of the magnetic field. Part uh, B, what is the EMF generated in the coil? Here is the problem. This flux is time dependent. It has cosine of the omega t in here. And since the flux in this area changes with time, it's going to induce an EMF in the circuit, given by Faraday Lenz law. So Faraday Lenz law says that there is an EMF now, and that EMF, we know exactly what it is. The EMF is going to be minus the, the rate at which the flux of the magnetic field is changing with time. It doesn't care about the flux of the electric field. The only thing that matters for this expression for Faraday Lenz law, so this is Faraday Lenz, is uh, the magnetic flux. And since we already have it, all I have to do is take the derivative of the cosine. Note the following. The derivative of cosine omega t is actually omega times the sine of omega t. So we're back to the sine again. So, but there is an omega that's going to come out. So what we end up with is two E naught A over C times K. And I have an omega that comes out from the derivation. And I have a minus sign in here because the formula has a minus sign in it, except the derivative of cosine is actually a minus sign. And I have a minus from uh, Lenz law. And the minus and the minus cancel and become a positive. Okay. And then everything else stays the same. Sine of Ka, this doesn't care about uh, K over two, doesn't care about the time. And this becomes simply a sine of omega t. So this is basically the entire EMF that is generated in the circuit. It's a kind of complicated, but it is. Now there is another thing in here. Note that omega is equal to CK actually, omega equal to CK. This is a dispersion law that we found. That was one of the highlights of the lecture this morning. Here, omega is equal to Kc. So the numerator and the denominator, they cancel. They have terms that do cancel. In other words, this omega cancels this Ck. And the actual expression for the electric field, uh, the, uh, the flux is going to be epsilon, is going to be 2 times E naught a times the sine of Ka over 2. This whole thing is just the amplitude of the voltage. So this is V0, if you wish, times the, uh, the, the temporal behavior, which is just a sine of omega t. So we have found everything now for this problem. Okay. So this is, this is like a, an alternating current 
This is its V naught, and the omega is this one. So we have its V naught, which is everything in here. V naught is two e two a times e naught times the sine of k a over two, and this is V naught. This is the maximum voltage. The RMS, V RMS is V naught over square root of two, and that will become just square root of two because two and square root of two cancel, A E naught sine of K A over two. So if we ever need that, we have a two, okay? So then we have everything in here for this problem. Part C, that was part B. Part C, what is the electromagnetic wave has a frequency? So they gave us F in there. So let me change the pen again so that we can have a, at least each section by itself. So now part C, they gave us a frequency and the frequency is equal to four megahertz or four times 10 to the power six hertz. So that is the frequency. Immediately we know omega. Omega is equal to two pi times the frequency, which means it's eight pi times 10 to the power six radians per second. So that is what omega is, okay? Here, of this voltage, this is what the uh, omega is, okay? We need probably the K2, if you guys remember, uh, omega two equal to KV, KC, so from here, K is equal to omega over C. And omega is this number, eight pi times 10 to the power six, divided by C, which is three times 10 to the power eight. And this is gonna be in one over meters, the units for K. So K is going to be eight pi divided by three times 10 to the negative two, uh, one over meters. If you cancel the 10 to the negative two, it's gonna be in centimeters, basically one over centimeters, okay? In other words, the wavelength is what? Three over four, three fourth of a uh, centimeter, very tiny. In other words, this is how, what I'm thinking, in order to find the, the wavelength lambda, lambda is two pi over K and uh, two pi over K actually is equal to two pi over eight pi times three, so it's a little different than that. And, oh man, it's a lot longer than this. It's actually 10 to the power two meters, okay? So it's a very long wave, so that's fine, okay? I, I, I mean, I'm exploring, I'm going step beyond, okay? This is three fourths, so it's gonna be 0.75 times 10 to the power two meters or 75 meters. They didn't ask me any of these questions, but I'm just telling you, okay? So if you ever want to know, things you can find them because they gave you the frequency so you have a bunch of information that you can pull from it okay but probably omega will be important because it's needed in here in the signal okay so they gave us f what else do we know in here what else did they give us and they gave us the intensity i which is 100 watts per meter squared now we are in business they gave us the intensity of the wave i is equal to 100 watts per meter squared Remember, that's the average pointing vector, okay? And they gave us also a number of turns n. Oh man, I forgot to include n. All of these calculations is just for a single loop. This EMF, this flux is for a single loop. You have to multiply this number by n because this flux is only for a value for the magnetic field from one of them, but you have a bunch of them. So we have to multiply n everywhere in here. There is an n in here, there is an n in here. So please make that correction in here. So there is an N in this expression everywhere because I forgot that there are actually N of them. This is N. So everywhere, this flux is N times because there are N loops, not just one. And there is an N in here too, multiplying everything in here. And that is also multiplying the intensity in here. So there is an N everywhere. So they tell me in here, so this is the intensity has an N in it too. And this one also has an N in it too. Okay. 
So we, they gave us n to be 50 turns, because really an antenna needs to have several loops in order to even capture anything uh, special in here. So n is 50. And also what else? And the length A is 10 centimeters. So A is 10 centimeters or 0 0.1 meters, okay? What else do we know? It follows that it's self-inductance. So they gave you also the self-inductance L, which we can really calculate, but it's 78 microhenry or 78 times 10 to the negative 3 Henry. Okay, so they give us L. And they give us R also. R in the circuit R is equal to 100 ohms. So they gave us a bunch of information in here. And uh, what value of the capacitance C results in the resonance of the LRC circuit with the signal, with the, uh, with the uh, circuit being equal to the frequency of the wave. So here is a problem. You have a wave coming with its own omega. You would want to change your C to tune it. You would want to change C to tune it in such a way that the omega naught of the circuit is the same as the omega of the signal. Why? Because at that point you would be at resonance. In other words, this is the resonance curve in here. The station is emitting at omega frequency and your omega naught better be equal to omega naught so that you maximize the current. So this current in here will be at its max in this resonance uh, behavior. So in order for you to achieve that, you would want the omega naught. You would want, in the old days, the tuners actually were a bunch of uh, capacitors. When you turn the dial, all you're doing is making the opening bigger or smaller. I remember from uh, chapter 24, I believe, or 23 or something like that, we calculated the capacitance and we found that it has to do with the cross section and the distance between the plates. So now the cross section matters. So when you open it, there is less cross section. When you uh, close it, there is more cross section. So you're playing with C when you do the tuning of the, the, the radio to capture specific frequency. So that's what we're doing now. We want the omega to be in such a way that omega of the signal equals to the omega naught of the circuit. Omega naught of the circuit is simply one over square root of LC. And this must match the number that we just found, nam namely uh, 8 pi times 10 to the power 6. So this may, they must be the same, 8 pi times 10 to the power 6, if it's, or omega. If I square these quantities in here and invert them, this is the, basically what I have. Now, I, L is fixed. L is the number of terms in geometry which I can't play with too much. But I can always change the dial in such a way to find the proper C. So 1 over LC must be equal to omega squared, in which case that C must be equal to 1 uh, over L omega squared. And if I do the math calculate properly, I should find the correct value for uh, C. So C should be one over L. L, is, they said, is 78 millihenry. Microhenry or millihenry? It's a microhenry. Seven to the negative six. It's a microhenry. Please pay attention to these things, OK? I already. Got it wrong in here, it's 10 to the negative six. And then you have omega squared. Omega squared, you have to square this number basically, which is eight pi times 10 to the power six. So it's eight pi times 10 to the power six, the whole thing squared. Okay, one of 10 to the power six, and another 10 of the power six, they cancel. So I'll be left with one of them. So I will have a 10 to the negative six in here. Because when I take it up, it's going to be 10 to the negative 6. So all I have to do now is do the rest of the algebra, which is 1 over 78 times 8 pi squared. So it's going to be a small number. OK? So 1 over, let me leave it in the denominator, OK? Let me leave everything just to see how we're we going. So 78 times 10 to the negative 6 times open parentheses 8 pi. 10 to the power 6, close the parentheses, square that frequency, square it, where's the arrow up, here, square it, and close the parentheses for the inversion, 
So it's still giving me 2.02 .02 times 10 to the negative 11. So C is actually equal to 20.2 times 10 to the negative 12 farads or 20.2 nanofarad, which is typical number for our capacitors, okay? So this is the capacitance. So if you want to really capture this signal, you need to play around with your dial until the frequent, the capacitance is this number, then the circuits will be in resonance and the current will be at its max because the current in the circuit, remember, I naught will be equal to V naught over Z. And Z, if you remember, is equal to the square root, this is chapter 31, plus uh, XL minus XC squared. At resonance, these two quantities will be equal to one another. In other words, the difference is zero. At resonance, XL is equal to XC, okay? So in this case, these two numbers cancel and Z at resonance is equal to R. So the current will be V naught over R. And the, R, uh, the IRMS is going to be the VRMS divided by R. At resonance, Z is equal to R. And since we are at resonance, we're going to divide just by the resistance and the resistance in this case is 100 ohms, okay? The question is, question D is, what is the current, the RMS value of the current RMS that's frozen in that case? So that's exactly the next question. So let me change color one more time to answer the last question in here. And let's go back to black in here. So in order for me to find the IRMS, IRMS is the VRMS that we found up there divided by R. And we have the VRMS. Don't forget the N in it. I just plugged it back in. So it has square root of 2A times N times the sine of KA divided by 2. Divided the whole thing by A. a. So we have square root of 2 times, what is it? I forgot, E naught times A E naught times N times A times E naught times N divided by R and times that sine of KA over two. Okay, I need to find this KA over two before I plug in the numbers because that's probably going to make a big difference in here. Okay, so KA over two, remember K is, uh, K is what? Uh, we calculated it actually at some points. Here is K, eight pi divided by three times 10 to the negative two. So this is eight pi. Divided by three times 10 to the negative two and divided by two now in this expression times A and A is 10 to the negative one because it's 10 centimeters. So this whole business in here, so the two cancels the eight, I'll be left with four in here. So this is four pi divided by 3000. My point being in here is this Ka over uh, is a tiny number. As a matter of fact, if you do four pi divided by four pi divided by 3000, the answer is 0 0.004 radians, 0 0.00418 or 0 0.242. So this is a very, very small angle in radians. This is in radians because all of this calculation is just numerical calculation. So we didn't convert it to degrees or anything like that. So this is in radians, it's a very small angle. And for small angles, there is a, you do the Taylor series, which says basically that's a sine of X for small values of X is basically X minus X cubed over three factorial plus X to the power five over five factorial minus X to the power seven over seven factorial and so on and so forth. But remember this number is 0 0.04. How many zeros? Zero, now there is another zero in here. So when you cube it, it's gonna be a zero point bunch of zeros before you find the next number in here. And when you, this is cube it, not square it, okay? So if there are three decimal points in here, there will be nine. And then X to the power five, forget about it, because it's gonna be 15 and so on and so forth. So this number is pr practically zero in front of this one. Every other number is zero. So the only thing that matters in here that sine of X is pr practically equals to X. So now we're ready to solve. So now, we find the IRMS equals to square root of two times A, which is 10 to the negative one, times the electric field. Or oh, they, didn't, they didn't give us the electric field. So we need to find it. They gave us the intensity. 
And the electric field from an expression that we found above, it's two mu naught C times I. So we need to do that to find the electric field in here because we need it in here. So uh, that is square root of two times mu naught, which is four pi times 10 to the negative seven times the speed of light, which is three times 10 to the power eight times the intensity they told us and the intensity they told us in this problem is 100 watts per meter square, 10 to the power two under the square root. So let me find that electric field because I need, to, I need this value in here. So it's square root of, open parentheses, we have two times four pi times 10 to the negative seven times three times 10 to the power 10 because 10 to the power eight and 10 to the power two, it's 10. Okay, close the parentheses. So the electric field is 274. How many seconds do we have in this problem here? We have three sig figs, so it's 275 actually, volt per meter. So we need 275 in here, okay? So that is E naught times N, which is 500, uh, 50, I'm sorry, 50 turns, divided by R, and R is 100, the speed of, uh, I mean, the resistance and times the sine, and I just argued that the sine is the same because it's so small number, it's four pi divided by 3,000. Four pi divided by 3,000. So one of the zeros cancels that zero and uh, basically, actually let's leave it in here. This zero cancels just the zero, this sent to the negative. So uh, let's see here, how much do we have? We have square root of two. Let's leave the square root of two at the end. So. We have 275. Please verify all of these numbers, okay? Times five, because I have a five left in here. Times a four pi, times four, times pi, and times square root of two. And the whole thing is divided by, open parentheses, 3,000 times 100 or 300,000. 300,000, I cannot write. Oh, let me write 3,100, how is that? Okay, if I didn't miss any number in here, the answer is 0 0.0814 amps. The current IRMS is 0 0.0814 one five amps if I around, around the next number, amps. <clears throat> In other words, how many? 81.5 milliamp, which is a typical number for this current. It's a long problem, isn't it? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's pretty long, a lot of work. Yeah, a lot of work, a lot of things, and uh, a lot of concepts, we have Faraday's law, we have Taylor series in it, we have chapter 31 in it, we have chapter 32 in it. So it's really a, a good synthesis problem. It's a big problem, okay? Uh, I think my hand needs some ice. I'm sorry? I think my hand needs some ice. <laughs> it's a bunch of things, bunch of notions. We have the resonance in here from chapter 31. We have at some point the EMF and going all the way to back when we define the flux, actually, which is the area integrated over the area to find the flux, the actual flux before we reach this point. And even, I mean, I know I'm explaining it and if I'm doing it at an exam, I probably will be a little bit more careful, but the point being in here, I forgot the N until the end is when it was given, hey, N is 50. Wow, I forgot the end and I started going back and fixing it. We have stuff from this chapter and everything is coming together. Here is the point though, forget about everything else for right now, conceptually though, okay? This is what's going on. You have basically a loop in here. And in the loop, there is an area and there is a magnetic field that somehow will end up in there. And that magnetic field changes with time. So therefore it's flux must be time dependent, which means that it's going to induce an EMF in the circuit. That EMF will have a 
current running through it. That current will be maxed only and only if the frequency of this variation match the natural frequency of the circuit, which is one over uh, LC under the square root. So we need to tune that. And if we do that, then the impedance of the circuit will become just the R, okay? In which case the current will be at its max. Believe it or not, this current is not really the, uh, the, 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 the smallest can get, can get smaller than that. If you change slightly the dial, the C will be too different, in which case you will be on this side of the, uh, the resonance curve, on this side of the resonance curve or the other side of the recurve. In either case, the I will be a lot less than its maximum value, which is now reading 81.5 milliamp. Okay, so it's kind of a small value, but that is the point of the, basically how antennas work for uh, your phone, for your TV, for everything else. This is basically the principle behind them. Actually, any circuit in here, it has an oscillator next to it. And the oscill this is called an oscillating uh, circuit in here. And it's made up basically of this uh, 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 inductors and capacitors and resistors. And that's really the point of it. This one is digital though, there is no dial on it. So when you, if you want to chill with the remote up and down, the remote up and down will change the natural frequency, will change the value of the capacitance at well, okay? And then in this case, it's going to be in resonance with the next station and so on and so forth, okay? So that is basically how you do it. But in the old days, there is a dial actually, and you have to physically turn the dial on and off. I know some of the radios now they have dials, but those dials are actually fake dials in a sense. It's still actually a, uh, it's a, uh, or they change actually from a connector to a connector. They switch from one circuit to another circuit to another circuit, from this capacitor to the other capacitor, to the other capacitor. But those are limited in capacity in the sense that the, you can have only a certain number of discrete values. Let's say, for example, 10 stations. You can receive only 10 stations. But in the old days, you can vary the frequency as long as it's within the range that the FCC uh, regulates. As long as the emitting station is within that range, your radio can go from one end to the other on a continuous fashion. Okay? And like the digital ones now that can jump, and they can jump actually nowadays even with these small fractions of the points. So in other words, you still can cover a huge number of frequencies that are coming in that range that is regulated still by the FCC. So in other words, this is basically how telecommunication works. This is how uh, receiving signal works, okay? I was tempting actually to do problem 50, but at the end I uh, 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 did not do it. Problems 50, 50 is basically has to do with polarization. I mentioned that in the beginning. I was also going to do problem 51 and 52 with you guys, but problem 51 and 52 will not have an impact on your exam. What they will do though, have an impact on your physics 4D. Because in physics 4D, you will see that uh, people discovered the, uh, the electron. And then uh, when Mr. Rutherford did this experiment, he found that the, the vast majority of the atom is empty space, basically, which means that the nucleus, which must exist to have an, uh, a neutral atom, must be in a central location called the nucleus, and the electrons must be outside spinning around it. But then, if you do any kind of calculation, that atom is unstable because the electron will spin very fast. It takes a fraction of a second for it to fall on the on the on the uh, on the uh, on the nucleus, and those are problems 51 and 52. For problems 51, it gives you the formula for the rate at which the energy is dissipated by an accelerating an electron, and this is exactly what's going on in an antenna. In an antenna, you have an electron going back and forth because of the electricity going back and forth, and that is how it radiates energy to begin with. That is how the power is generated for an antenna transmission antenna. It uses this formula. But because we cannot derive it at this level, it really requires an advanced course of derivation. So I am kind of hesitant not to get into this stuff at this level because it gets a little bit, uh, I mean, what is the source of this expression? Because the expression has the square of the acceleration and the square of the acceleration in here gives you that expression. Obviously for an antenna transmitting back and forth, you don't really need quantum mechanics to get the power that is dissipated and from there, how far the signal, the signal becomes too weak or how much amplification you need to do from your end to uh, once you receive the signal. You can clearly see with this signal, I have a decent uh, power in here because even 81.5 milliamp is still a good, uh, good, uh, good current. And that is because the power received at that point is a hundred watts per meter squared. So it's still pretty intense, okay? So in other words, the circuit is not too far from the source, okay? 
If the circuit becomes too far, this I drops a lot. It drops like one over four pi R squared with the, the initial power. So that means I will become too weak, which means the electric field will be too weak, which means at the end, the current will be too weak to be picked up, okay? So especially with the background noise that you have in there with the, all of the other things that are going on. So maybe your, uh, your IOC circuit, will, even though it's probably uh, in sync with the, with, the, uh, with the signal, but it's not gonna pick up anything in there, okay? It's not gonna pick up a strong signal, strong current in there to make sense out of it. In other words, you're not gonna see the needle move a lot. You think that there is nothing because the needle will require a certain uh, current for it to move. Okay, so those are your problems for chapter 32, please go through them. And if you have any questions, I know a lot of you are not in here, please do not hesitate to ask. We still have uh, classes that are basic. We can meet during the scheduled times or we can meet off scheduled times. And uh, if a question really becomes of interest to everybody else, I'll be more than happy to record it for everybody else. Actually, I will require to record it for everybody else, but I will ask your permission, of course, to do that. So that at least we, we are live and recording. Then if we are back to private discussion, basically then at that point, we are not going to record it. Thank you guys. It has been really a pleasure to have you in my class and uh, I wish you the best of luck. I know some of you are uh, with me in other activities. So hopefully we can get those activities done too. And uh, we have an exam next week on Thursday and we have another final the week after that. We have quizzes and we have uh, labs also that are due. Some of you missed some of the assignments, so please go back and fix them and make sure that you submit them. If I did not grade it, it's, there is still time for it to, to, have to be submitted. The homework is going to be pulled from uh, Pearson. So whatever is done at that point is going to be taken from Pearson and is going to be included in your overall grade. The homework, I think, has a weight of 20% over your overall grade, so it's very important to you make sure that it's also finished. If for some reason you're into some difficulty, please let me know. Now is the time because uh, everything is coming together. I really would hate to see you not pass the class or pass it with not the, the proper grade that you deserve. So please complete everything, submit everything, and let's get this thing finished. Thank you very much, guys. Great. Thank you. Same to you. Um, yeah, thank you for everything that you have done in this no whole class, you know, all these lectures and so many problems throughout this whole semester. It's been a blast. Um, Let me yeah. record, probably some other people might uh, have uh, different things. Okay. Mm -hmm.